Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video we're going to look at defining stability for numerical methods for ODE initial value problems. We're first going to look at how we can define stability in this case, and we'll then carry out some example calculations for the forward and backward Euler discretizations. These calculations will actually highlight some general principles about numerical stability for different numerical methods. In the previous video, we looked at the convergence properties of our numerical methods for ODE initial value problems. And specifically, we looked at the accuracy of our numerical solutions as our step size h tends to zero. However, it's also crucial for us to look at the stability properties of our numerical methods and understand what finite and practical values of h will give numerically stable results. And ideally, we'd like our numerical methods to give us stable results for as large a value of h as possible. And this is because, all else being equal, larger step sizes will require fewer time steps and therefore be more efficient. So it's worth thinking about what we would actually require when we refer to stability. And the key idea is that we'd like our numerical methods to inherit the stability properties of the underlying ordinary differential equation. And suppose that we have an unstable ODE. Then we can't expect that our numerical discretization will give us stable results. However, if we do have a stable ODE, then in that case, we would really like that our numerical discretization will give us stable results as well. And therefore, the first thing that we'll do is discuss ODE stability in the mathematical sense, independent of any numerical discretization. To define ODE stability, let's look at the ODE of the form y prime equal f of t and y. And let's look at two solutions to this ODE with similar initial conditions. So we'll define y of t to be the solution with the initial condition that y of 0 is equal to y subscript 0. And we'll define y hat of t to be the solution with the initial condition where y hat of 0 is equal to y hat subscript 0. And we'll define ODE stability if the following property is satisfied. For every epsilon greater than 0, there exists a delta greater than 0, such that if our initial conditions are within a distance of delta from each other in norm, then our solutions should be within a distance of epsilon from each other in norm for all t greater than or equal to zero. And this definition therefore implies that if we make a small input perturbation in that initial condition, then that should only lead to a small perturbation in the solution. There's a stronger form of stability, referred to as asymptotic stability, where we require that the norm of y of t minus y hat of t should tend to zero as t tends to infinity. And in this case, any small input perturbations will actually decay over time. So in these two definitions, we're really looking at stability properties of the underlying mathematical ODE. And this is independent of any numerical algorithm. And it's worth noting here that the nomenclature is actually a little confusing compared to what we have used in previous units. So previously, when we've been looking at stability, this has often been in the context of the conditioning of the problem. And we were specifically looking at stability in the context of the numerical approximation. In ODEs, and also for PDEs, it's standard to use stability to refer to the sensitivity of both the mathematical problem and also the numerical approximation. To examine our definition of ODE stability, let's look at the example equation of y prime equal lambda y for a scalar function y of t, where lambda is a parameter that can be varied. And for this equation, we can analytically write down the difference between two solutions. We know that y of t minus y hat of t will be equal to y0 minus y hat 0, all multiplied by e to the lambda t. Let's first look at this equation for the case when lambda equal minus 1. And I've drawn two sample solutions starting from y equal 1 and y equal 2. And in this case, both solutions will decay exponentially to 0. And the difference between them will also decay to 0. 
And so in this case, we have asymptotic stability. Now let's look at the case when lambda equals zero. And in this case, our ODE just reads y prime equals zero, and therefore y will be constant. And if we look at our two solutions in this case, starting from y equal one and y equal two, then they will just remain constant. And since they don't diverge from each other, then we will be able to satisfy our stability definition. By starting our solutions arbitrarily close to one another, we can ensure that they will remain arbitrarily close throughout all time. Now let's look at the case when lambda equal one. So in this case, we'll have exponential growth in our solutions and the difference between two solutions will also grow exponentially. So this is a case where our ODE will be unstable. We can generalize this now to the case when lambda is a complex number. So let's suppose that lambda equals a plus ib, where a and b are real numbers. In this case, our general solution would have the form y of t is equal to y0 times e to the a plus ib all multiplied by t. And we can write that as y0 times e to the at times e to the ibt. And the e to the ibt term can be expanded as cosine bt plus i sine bt. And this term involving trigonometric functions will have complex magnitude always equal to one. And therefore, if we're looking at the magnitude of our solution, then it will be determined by the e to the at term. And therefore, for stability, it's only dependent on the sine of a, which is equal to the real part of lambda. And so in general, we'll have that the real part of lambda less than zero gives us asymptotic stability. The real part of lambda equal to zero gives us stability, but not asymptotic stability. And the real part of lambda greater than zero gives us an unstable solution. Now that we've got an understanding of the stability for this scalar equation, y prime equal lambda y, we can generalize this to the vector equation, y prime equal a y, where now y is an n component vector and a is an n by n matrix. So let's suppose now that a is diagonalizable and we have the eigenvalue decomposition, a is equal to v times lambda times v inverse, where lambda is a diagonal matrix where the diagonal entries are lambda j, which are the eigenvalues of the matrix A. And v is a matrix with eigenvectors as columns, v1, v2, up to vn. In this case, we can rewrite our ODE y prime equal a y in terms of z prime equal lambda z, where now z is equal to v inverse y, and our initial condition z0 is equal to v inverse of y0. Hence, our matrix z prime equal lambda z actually decouples into n separate equations for the component zi. And the stability of a component zi will be governed by the corresponding eigenvalue lambda i. Since z and y are related by the matrix v, then roughly speaking, if all of the zi are stable, then all of the yi will also be stable. And therefore, assuming that our matrix v is well conditioned, then we have that if the real parts of all of the lambda i are less than or equal to zero, then that tells us that our equation y prime equal a y will be a stable ODE. Now let's look at the stability of different numerical approximations to ODEs. So we'll define y subscript k and y hat subscript k to be the numerical approximations to our ODE for two different initial conditions. And we'll define that our numerical approximation is stable if it satisfies the following definition. For every epsilon greater than zero, there exists a delta greater than zero, such that if our initial conditions are within a distance delta in norm from each other, then our numerical solutions will be a distance of epsilon from each other in norm for all k greater than or equal to zero. 
So you can see that this is really a direct analog of our previous definition for the stability of the mathematical ODE. Now, the key idea is that we want to develop numerical methods that mimic the stability properties of the exact solution. So if the ODE that we're approximating is unstable, then we can't expect that our numerical solution should be stable. Now, it's worth noting that ODE stability is problem dependent, and therefore, we need a standard test problem to consider. And typically, the standard test problem that's taken is the simple scalar ODE, y prime equal lambda y, that we've already been looking at. And experience shows that the behavior of a discretization on this test problem gives a lot of insight into the numerical stability properties of the discretization in general. So ideally, to reproduce the stability of this ODE y prime equal lambda y, we're going to require that our discretization will be stable for all values where the real part of lambda is less than or equal to zero. Let's now look at stability of the forward Euler discretization of our test problem. So here then, we'll have that yk plus one is equal to yk plus h times lambda times yk. And we can rearrange that to get that yk is equal to one plus h lambda to the power of k times y zero. And therefore, we can define that one plus h lambda is the amplification factor. And for stability, we'll therefore require that this amplification factor has magnitude less than or equal to one. And we'll write h bar equal to h times lambda for simplicity. So therefore, we'll require then that one plus h bar should have magnitude less than or equal to one. So if we now write that h bar is equal to a plus ib, then if we substitute this in, we'll find that we require that one plus a squared plus b squared has to be less than or equal to one. Hence, the forward Euler method will be stable if h bar is contained within the disk of radius one centered on minus one comma zero in the complex plane. And we'll note that this disk is a subset of the left half plane where the real part of h bar is less than or equal to zero that corresponds to the region where our underlying mathematical ODE will be stable. As a result, we say that the forward Euler method is conditionally stable. And when the real part of lambda is less than or equal to zero, we have to restrict h in order to ensure stability. And suppose that we look at a lambda that's real and negative. So in this case, we'll require that minus two is less than or equal to h times lambda, which is less than or equal to zero. And therefore, h has to be less than or equal to minus two divided by lambda. And we'll note here that larger values of negative lambda will give us a tighter restriction on h. So for example, if lambda is equal to minus 10, then that will imply that h has to be less than or equal to 0.2 and if lambda is equal to minus 200, then we'll have the h has to be less than or equal to 0 0.01. And we'll now take a look at a Python example, e underscore stab dot pi, that can examine what goes wrong if we take h outside of this stability region. Let's now look at the program e underscore stab dot pi that can examine the stability properties for the forward Euler method. And this program is rather similar to the previous example, Euler.py, that we looked at. And it solves the same ODE, y prime is equal to lambda times y, using the initial data that y of 0 is equal to 1. And this problem has the exact solution, y of t is equal to e to the lambda t. So if we look at this program, we first define our initial value of y equal 1. We set the time t equals 0 and we use an integration step size of h is equal to 0.1. And we'll then choose the constant in the ODE. So here, we'll first try lambda equal minus five. And as mentioned in the slides, if we define h bar to be h times lambda, then we require that h bar is within the range from minus two to zero. 
And if we look at this diagram in the bottom left, then we see that for this case, h bar is equal to minus 0.5, and that puts us firmly within the region where we expect stable behavior. So if you look at the rest of this program, we'll apply forward Euler steps until we reach t equal 1. We can compute the analytical solution, and we can print both the analytical and numerical solutions. We can then perform our numerical Euler step and update our time variable. So let's now go ahead and run this program. And by default, this program outputs its results to the terminal. And we see four columns of information. We have the time value, the numerical solution, the exact solution, and the difference. So let's now run this program again and send the results to a temporary file called out. And we'll now plot the results in GNU plot. So in GNU plot, I've set the axis labels. I've set the size for points that will be shown on the plot. And I've set my initial value of lambda. And I'm now going to plot over this time range from 0 to 1 my exact solution, e to the lambda times t. And I'm also going to plot my numerical solution, and I'm going to use lines with circles to illustrate the individual numerical steps. And for this case, this is what we see. And overall, we see good agreement between our exact and numerical solutions. And we also see, as expected, that we have stable behavior in this case and both solutions decay as time increases and tend to zero. One thing that's worth noting is that with forward Euler steps, each step is based on evaluating the derivative y prime and taking the step based on assuming that that y prime is constant over the length of the step. And that means then that if we look at our initial step, then we can see that the gradient of our numerical step exactly matches the gradient of our exact solution there. And so we see that the green line and the blue line here have the exact same slope at t equals 0. Once we get to further steps, because there are some small numerical differences between the exact and numerical solutions. This relationship is no longer true, but for this initial step, we have that precise agreement. So now let's look at changing lambda to minus 12.5. That will mean that our value of h bar is now equal to minus 1.25. And we'll now run this program again. And again, we will expect stable behavior because this value of h bar is within the stability region. So let me now update the value of lambda within GNU plot and plot the new set of numerical results. So in this case, we still see stable behavior, although the picture is slightly different. And we can see that after one numerical step, our numerical solution has actually now gone negative. And if we were to calculate an amplification factor for this case, then we would find that the amplification factor is actually negative. And this makes sense if we look at how the numerical solution matches the gradient of our exponential at t equals 0. Because the exponential has a sharper gradient in this case, 
when we match that gradient and we take this step of size 0.1 then our step actually overshoots 0 and goes negative. However, because it only goes negative by a small amount, we still have convergence to 0 in the end and these small overshoots decay away as time progresses and we still have that stable behavior in this case. So finally let's look at the case of lambda equal minus 21 and for this case we'll have that h bar is equal to minus 2.1 and we are now slightly outside of the numerical stability region. So let's now run our program again. And we'll now update the value of lambda within GNU plot. And we'll plot our results. And so here we now indeed see that our numerical solution has gone unstable. And we can see why this happens. Now again we still have that, that initial step our numerical solution matches the gradient of our exact solution however here if we follow this over this interval of size 0.1 then our step overshoots by so much that it actually goes beyond a value of minus one and that means that as we take successive steps then we overshoot by more and more and more and more. And that then leads to unstable behavior. And over time, our numerical solution will exponentially grow. This is an undesirable situation because our numerical solution is no longer mimicking the stability properties of the underlying mathematical solution. And this therefore shows why we need to restrict our choice of H for this numerical scheme in order to achieve stability. Let's now consider the backward Euler discretization for our standard test problem y prime equal lambda y. And in this case, our numerical method will give us that yk plus 1 is equal to yk plus h times lambda times yk plus 1. And we can rearrange this to get that yk is equal to 1 divided by 1 minus h times lambda, all to the power of k, multiplied by y0. So here, we see that our amplification factor is given by 1 divided by 1 minus h lambda, and therefore for stability, we require that 1 divided by the magnitude of 1 minus h lambda has to be less than or equal to 1. So again, we'll define that h bar is equal to h times lambda, and we'll expand that in terms of components as a plus ib. And we'll see that for stability, we therefore require that 1 minus a all squared plus b squared has to be greater than or equal to 1. And this region will correspond to the entire complex plane apart from the disk of radius 1 centered on 1 comma 0. And we'll see that this region actually contains the entire left half plane where our mathematical ODE is stable. And therefore, for any lambda where the real part of lambda is less than or equal to zero, we can see that there is actually no restriction on our step size h in order to achieve stability. As a result, we say that backward Euler is unconditionally stable and we don't have any restrictions on h to achieve stability. So in general, implicit methods often have larger stability regions than explicit methods. And that allows us often to take larger time steps with an implicit method. However, explicit methods require less work per time step, since you don't need to solve to find yk plus 1. So therefore we see that there's a trade-off and the choice of method can really depend on the details of the problem at hand.